All right, um, let's focus there on verse 30, Psalm 68, verse 30, where it says, Rebuke the company of spearmen, the multitude of the bulls, with the calves of the people, till everyone submit himself with pieces of silver. Scatter thou the people that delight in war. And uh, let's just, I'll just pray before we get started there. Um, God, please help me expound these words and help, help me to... Uh, uh, give understanding to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to focus on the last part of that verse there, which says, Scatter thou the people that delight in war. And so the title of my message this morning is Delighting in War. Okay? And I don't know if any of you have been paying attention to the news. You're better off not paying attention to the news, to be honest. Um, but the, it seems like some people are at least saying, oh, World War III has started because Iran attacked uh, Israel. And, you know, they sent, to, you know, whatever it was, so many missiles, so many drones, and so many cruise missiles or whatever. Apparently, there was, altogether there was like 330 or something like that. And only like 1% of them got through. So that, you do the math, it's only like three. Three that actually got through. And where did, did they actually hit something important? Whatever. I think if Iran really wanted to attack, they would do something. And I'm not pro-Iran, okay? But what I am for is not delighting in war. Because in war, bad things happen, okay? And it's a shame that some Baptists glorify war, right? They glory in war. They're like, we should go over there and just turn these Muslim countries into a parking lot. And that's not what we should do. They're people just like... Um, the Israelites are people, and just like we are people, and, and I shouldn't call them Israelites, but the Israelis. And you know, in, in Proverbs 26, 17, the Bible says, He that passeth by and meddleth with stripe, belonging not to him, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. Okay, so you see, like if you'd see two guys fighting on the street, would you just go in there and pull them apart? No, you're going to get hurt, right? And so the U.S. and Canada and the UK and everybody should just stay out of that. If Iran and Israel are fighting, just leave it because it does have um, the possibility of turning into a broader conflict if they do that, right? And in fact, that's one of the reasons why World War II started, right? Because of all these alliances. You know, Biden wants to act tough and say, well, we're going to stand behind Israel and, you know, if they get attacked, we're going to help them. Well, guess what? Putin says he's standing behind uh, Iran, right? And so... Should we be, oh yeah, cool, so we're going to see fireworks, we're going to see all these cool things happen. No, okay. We, you know, we've lived in peace and we don't know what it's like, but just reading about it and reading about it in the Bible, it's, it, we, don't, we should not delight in war, right? As kids, and, it, and even as men, we, we like machines that can do certain things. We like guns, right? But I really like shooting guns, but I don't like killing people, though. There's a difference, right? You can like a machine, and maybe even that machine was built for killing people. But there's a difference between a defensive purpose and an offensive purpose. And, and just to, to like, you know, fast jets or, or you know, that you can blow up a tree stump or blow up the side of a mountain, whatever. But to glory and people dying, right? And and I forget which church it was, but I think, uh, wasn't it by my book, Bill Grady, involved with that? They had, you know, some Israeli soldier come to their one of their churches and he's explaining how they blew up this terrorist and the guts flew so and so far. And, and then the, these, these Baptists were getting giddy almost, right? They're just getting excited that some Muslim got blown up. Right? That's delighting in war, and we should not be like that. Turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 18. 2 Chronicles 18. And you know, the, the Baptists will say, well, we got, we got to you know, bless Israel, because the Bible says we should bless Israel. Well, no, it doesn't say that we should bless those people over there. Okay, it does not. And when we should pray for Jer the peace of Jerusalem, that's when the house of the Lord was in Jerusalem. They were actually following the Lord. Let's look at if we should, because those, those people that call themselves Jews over there, they hate the Lord Jesus, right? They, their Talmud talks very blasphemously, pervertedly about Jesus, that he's boiling in hot excrement. They say bad things about Mary, all these different things, right? Uh, Jews are taught to hate Jesus from a young age and say blasphemous things about him. So, 
And you know, what does the Bible say? You know, that, that if they don't have Jesus, they don't have the Father either, right? In 2 Chronicles 18, verse 3, and we're not going to read all of it, but we'll just get a few verses out of here. And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. Okay, so Ahab wants to go to Ramoth Gilead, and he wants to fight, right? Well, Israel wants to fight. You say, well, get the the Phil not Philistines, the Palestinians started it. They were the bulldozer, and then they, they started killing people. You know what? If you've researched the intelligence and the the military capabilities of Israel, that, that's like a false flag operation. Well, false flag is the wrong word, but it's like they allowed it to happen, right? Just like it seems, it seems like reading some of the reports that Pearl Harbor was allowed to happen so that the U.S. would get into the war and so their people would be for the war. And anyway, even if it wasn't. Right? They, 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 they could have, you know, they did their response, but then they keep going, and they keep going. And they're killing people in hospitals, and they're killing innocent civilians, and all these things, right? They just keep going to war, and the Baptists are just like, oh yeah, we should have done that years ago, right? And, and, I, I, and that's not a quote, right? But I know the attitude of some of these churches, and some of these pastors, and people. And, you know, part of the reason I know that is because I used to be pro-Israel, and I became pro-Israel because of my cousins, and he thought it was cool. You know, I ever hear about the seven-day war and all these different things, right? And, you know, and they tried saying that God is with Israel, so we should pray for Israel. And we're going to look at that, and, and they're not, God's not with them. In fact, three times in the book of Jeremiah, God told Jeremiah not to pray for the Jews, okay? Because they're wicked. And they're wicked now, so why should we pray for them now? Why should we support them financially now or send them weapons? I mean, the Americans will send them weapons. What do we got? We got, after we sent our four tanks to Ukraine, we have like four left, right? And we have airplanes that I don't know if we're running out of parts for or what. But we should not delight in war. And here, the king of Israel is asking the king of Judah, will you go with me? Right? And if Israel asked the United States, or if they asked Canada, or if they asked the United Kingdom, they should say, no, we're not going to meddle with strife not belonging to us. You go fight your war, your hatred, your ethnic hatred, right? Polish people against Arabs, right? Ashkenazis against the Arabs. Oh, no, they're, they're descended from Jacob. We all descend from Jacob. But the Bible says we're all of one blood. If you do the math on that, like, the chances are you have some, even Ashkenazi um, heritage. But anyway, so he's asking him. And Jeho Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Right? Because Jehoshaphat was a godly king. And while he got, I forget how many, and we're not going to take the time to go to it, but I think it was like 200 or, or a lot of, of prophets. And they all say, go, you're going to prosper, just go. Right? But then in verse 6, uh, Jehoshaphat asks a question. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that you might inquire of him? Because he realized these are these are watered-down preachers. They're false prophets. They're they're not going to tell the truth. And so he's like, can't, because like, they don't even look. Like, look at them. They don't even, you know, long, you know, they, they look like heathens. They don't look like um prophets of the Lord. That's, I mean, I'm guessing that part, right? There's something that tipped Jehoshaphat off that they weren't godly men. So he asked for another one, right? And I think, uh, I, I haven't turned there, I just got a copy. So there was one, I think it was his name, Micaiah, something like that. And, and anyway, he tells him, no, you shouldn't have gone, or you shouldn't go. You're gonna, you know, bad things will happen. But anyways, they go anyway. And look at next chapter in verse 2, 2 Chronicles 19.2. This is after the battle. And Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord, therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Right? If we go help the ungodly, we say, well, the Muslims, though, they're bad. They worship Allah and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But are the Jews any more godly? Just because they're both not good guys, we shouldn't get involved at all. We shouldn't be on the side of Iran. We shouldn't be on the side of Israel. We should just not be involved. And 
not just not be involved, we should not delight in it. We shouldn't take joy or pleasure in these Muslims or Israel, Israelis, for that matter, get involved. Okay? <coughs> or, or dying. That's, that's a wicked attitude. And it seems like from a young age, children are taught to love war. Just video games alone, right? You're, it's, it's like you, you kill people in a video game, and then all of a sudden it's not like no big deal. I just killed, you know, and in fact, you're probably bragging, I killed 100 players or whatever, whatever you call those um, people, like people, or maybe it's not people in that game, it's something else, but they dehumanize it. And not just that, it's used as a recruiting tool. The army and these people have investment and, and you know, um, some skin in the game, right? That the people are taught to kill people, right? And take pleasure in doing it, right? And taking pleasure when we kill our enemies. That's not what the Bible teaches. We're going to look at that. And so... Jehoshaphat is rebuked. He says, shouldest thou help the ungodly? He's like, you did not do right. You should not help. Ahab's a wicked man, and you helped him. And there, because of that, wrath is upon you. And so, well, are you saying the Jews are ungodly? Yeah, they're ungodly there. In fact, by still saying we've got to have the sacrifices, by still saying we've got to keep the Old Testament law, they're saying... You know, basically to hell with Jesus is what they're saying, right? They're, 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 they're saying, that Je they're just saying Jesus is no good. They're ungodly. They do not have the Son, and they do not have the Father, and they hate the Lord. And so the Bible says, should we help them not hate the Lord? No, because wrath will be upon us. Well, what about the Muslims? Well, not every, you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry, or whatever it is, like uh, Muhammad, I don't know any other names in, in, in that culture, right? They don't all hate the Lord. Yeah, the, the, the prophets that are not doing it in ignorance, that they're, they're, they're teaching a false religion. Yeah, they hate the Lord, but not every single, you know, dress-wearing Muslim, I just about said. Maybe it's not a dress. They wear pants underneath, but it sure looks weird when a dude's wearing that. But, the, but they don't hate the Lord necessarily. Right? So we should just completely stay out of it, not be happy about it, and not, especially in a church, right? Or we're going to, you know, send money so that the temple can be rebuilt, or so that they can get better sights on the rifles, or something weird like that. That's wicked. Well, the, these Baptist churches will say, but it's Israel, though. They're taught to worship Israel. And, like I already said, in Jeremiah... There's three times that it's mentioned not to pray for Israel, for, for uh, the Jews. And it's Jeremiah 7, 16, Jeremiah 11, 14, and Jeremiah 14, 11. And I'll read the last one for you. It says, Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. So if you're going to pray for them, not for their good. Wow. Like, I, I don't know. Do, do the... Do the the Zionist Baptist not read verses like this? Or do they not even read Galatians 3.16? Where it says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. You know, all those promises to Abraham, that's to us as Christians through Christ. It's not to those God rejecting, Jesus rejecting so-called Jews over there. They're not even Jews. Because it's not one that's one outwardly. It's one that's one inwardly. We're the Jews. We're Israel, but they're the synagogue of Satan. And we no, we should not support them. We should not pray for them. We should not bless. Oh, but we should pray for... No, don't pray for wicked people. Not, not the enemies of the Lord. You can pray for people that are wicked, but not the enemies of the Lord. Right? Obviously, we want wicked people to repent and believe on Jesus. Like, by repent, I mean, like, quit believing what they are trusting in before. Jesus. And, well, what about verses then, like Ecclesiastes 3, 8, that says a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Yeah, there is a time to have war. 
But when somebody else is having a fight, that's not the time for us to get involved. Okay? Some people on the other part of the world, oh, but, but they're, they're, that place is mentioned in the Bible. Yeah, but it also says we shouldn't pray for them, so we should not help them. We should not take uh, delight in their enemies being um, destroyed. And, uh, yeah, there's a time of war, but time of war is when somebody attacks you. That's when you should have a war. That's when you should have a battle. Um, in Proverbs 20, verse 18, it says, Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice make war. So there is a reason to have war. There is a reason to attack, but it's not just because of s some conflict that somebody else is having. In Proverbs 24, verse 6, it says, For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in multitude of counselors there is safety. Why multitude of counselors? Because somebody might be angry at somebody, but the next person might not. Somebody might be eager for bloodshed, but then the other counselors not. Right? Because there's always people that are hawkish. Right? They're pro-war. And you know what's funny? It all depends who's in power. When Trump was in power, Biden was saying, I just watched a clip of this uh, yesterday. Biden was saying, well, you can't have Trump in because he's going to bring us into war with Iran. And what's Biden doing now? Right? It all depends. Wh Whoever is not in government says, oh, the other one will bring us into war. Right? And they're against war. But when they're in power, they're for war. Right? They want to press the buttons and, and get people killed and, 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 and property destroyed. So, by wise counsel, you should make war, and multitude of counselors are safety, right? Because cooler heads can prevail. And you know what? Just because someone, you know, broke down your fence and killed some people, yeah, those people should be punished, right? I'm not saying that. But there's no reason to bring the whole world into war, or even to start a war with your neighbors. In Psalm 140, it's the Psalm of David. Starting verse 1, it says, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Selah. And you know, as Christians, we shouldn't be like this. We're just ready to fight at the drop of a hat, ready for our country to go to war at whatever, just because they're Muslims. Well, what about all the other false religions? Hindus, Buddhists. What about Catholics, right? I mean, Catholics killed a bunch of people in the Inquisition, right? But no, it's the, it's the Muslims. Why? Because they're neighbors with the Is Israelites. And, and they've done a good job of, of um, getting Christians, and some real Christians and some fake Christians, to worship Zionism, right? That, that Israel is the chosen people. Not that Israel that's over there isn't. They hate Jesus. They're not the chosen people. But the, this here in Psalm 140, David's saying, preserve me from these people that always want to fight. They always want to have violence. They always want to have a war. He says, continually are they gathered together for war. And, and you know what David's saying is, and he was a man that did some bloodshed, right? He fought the battles of the Lord. But he wasn't just like, go kill anybody. Like, what about Doeg the Edomite? Right? He was somebody like this. Remember when Saul um, you know, was wondering, like, uh, not, was it Abiathar or Ahimelech? Anyways, uh, one, of, one of the Lord's servants there gave him some bread. Right? And Doeg the Edomite was in ward there. And anyways, Saul's like to his men, kill all these people because they're in, in helping David. Nobody did it. But Doeg the Edomite, he was willing to do it. He killed everybody. And I think he even killed animals. Because he was somebody like this. Right? He was somebody that loved bloodshed. Um, and you know what? Maybe we're not like this, that we're for war. But are we always ready to, to, to pick a fight? Right? Do we always have a chip on our shoulder just ready for somebody to knock it off? That we're ready to blow up at them? Have a short fuse? Have a, have a temper? We shouldn't be like this. We should be people that, that can take some um, take some slights, right? The Bible says if somebody slaps you on the cheek, you should, you should turn the other cheek. Now, it does not say if somebody shoots you, let them shoot you in another place. It doesn't say that, right? That's not what the Bible's saying. But it's just, you're not supposed to just go start wars or get involved in other people's wars 
or start fights with, with people just for, for no reason. And people think war is cool. You know, I, and I think some machines of war are cool, but what the damage they do is not cool, though. Right? Especially like in Vietnam with napalm. And for, for those of you who don't know what napalm is, it's basically gas and soap so that the gasoline will, will stick to things and burn, including skin. That's not cool. People, and what about in, yeah, we, you know, I say we, but it was the Americans that dropped, uh, what was the, one was called Fat Boy, and I forget what the other, other uh, nuclear bomb was called. Anyway, they killed lots of people, but you know what, the people that didn't die uh, right away, some of them were walking dead with their skin basically falling off because of the heat of the nuclear blast. Do we want that? Is this so cool when people are dying or when people are dying of famine and disease because these armies are treading upon our grain or we can't, people can't get the food supplies shipped over? Because what happened in World War II wasn't just, the, the Germans didn't just go after our, um, our military equipment. They were hitting convoys of supply. Well, they're sending food and stuff to Britain. So they'd go after cargo ships and sink them. The U-boats would sink Cargo ships and passenger ships. There's innocent people that die because of war. Children. I mean, the disease caused by not having food and, and, and not having proper sanitary facilities. In uh, Isaiah 21, verse 15, it says, For they fled from the swords, from the drawn sword, and from the bent bow, and from the grievousness of war. War is grievous. It's not cool. It's not glory and guts. And, yeah, it's guts, but no glory. Right? The victor writes a story afterwards and how they were right and how they were justified and everything like that, but it's grievous. People's dads die. People's brothers die. People's uncles and grandpas die. And then children die too. And wives. Right? Do you think people care if there's some bystanders in the way of when they're shooting at their enemy? No, they hit their enemy so much they're going to shoot no matter what. Well, those other people shouldn't have been in the way. Well, they couldn't help because they were running from the other people. They are caught in the crossfire. Saul and Jonathan died because of battle. Obviously, they committed suicide. They fell on their sword. But David was grieved at Jonathan dying. He said, I'm distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? Right? David understood that war was not all good. Okay? His, his best friend, in fact, it seems like such a best friend that, that he loved him more than his multiple wives. Maybe because if he would only had one, he would, would have maybe loved her more. But, I mean, it's good to have a good friend, right? And to love your friend. But um, you should also love your wife. But it, obviously, it hurt him. Right? Just imagine if one of your family members would die in war or be a casualty of war. Now, they're, they're bombing the city where you're living in and you've got to go run out. Oh, that's no big deal. I'll go camp in the bush and trap and, and hunt and fish. Well, yeah, when everybody else is doing that, guess what? The wild animals are scared and they, they're going to run out. Right? Why do you think the children of Israel needed to have manna? It wasn't enough wild animals to feed all these people unless God would do a miracle and send all the quails so that there's, a, you know, a pile of them. I'll give you a couple st statistics. In World War II, apparently it was the deadliest military conflict in history to date. An estimated total of 70 to 85 million people perished. Why is it 70 to 85? Because you don't know. So, you know, because, first of all, maybe accurate counts of people weren't held back, back then, but it's like, there's no, like, accuracy in war, right? It's like, well, okay... You can't tell exactly, was that a body or is that part of that body? Because right? you just can't tell. So 70 to 85 million people perished. Or about 3% of the global population. So 3 out of every 100 people. So, well, that's not too bad odds. Well, guess what? It never really came to North America. Otherwise, it would have been higher. Right? In certain parts of the world. Deaths directly caused by the war, including military and civilian fatalities. So... Military people getting killed and, you know, innocent people in the crossfire uh, were about 50 to 56 million. But an additional 19 to 28 million people died from war-related disease and famine. Just think of that. How much, 
you know, that's about another, that's about half as much again, people die just because there's not enough food and because there's disease. That's crazy. And they say there's uh, about 5 million prisoners of war, the, de the deaths of 5 million prisoners of war that died too, right? And you know, maybe, maybe these p pastors and these people in churches in the United States and Canada, maybe they all, don't worry, because we're in North America, well, nothing will happen to us. Well, guess what? In the last war, they didn't really have intercontinental ballistic missiles. But even in the other war, they could have, they could have come off of our coast and shoot with a, with a submarine and, and shot missiles on, into Canada. And so that you don't even have time to react. And it could happen now. And you know, America, well, we've got the mightiest army. We've got enough nu nuclear bombs that we could blow up the world a hundred times over or how much, how, however much overkill they have now. Well, I think Revelation 18, they should maybe think of Revelation 18. So in verse 7, it says, How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Now this is talking about Babylon, and I believe it's very likely the United States, if, it, if this happens, you know, within the next hundred or so years. Um, and we'll read a little bit more context what, uh, to see why. But basically, Babylon here, and this isn't like actual Babylon, this is um, this end times Babylon. She's sitting, and by she is a country. See, I'm a widow. I'm not gonna, nothing bad's going to happen to me. I'm not going to see any sorrow. Right? We're going to fight these proxy wars, or these wars where we're going to send our aircraft carriers and, and, and our, our fleets over there, our soldiers over there. Nothing's going to happen here. Well, first of all, there's still people that you're sending over there that are dying. But the next world war is not necessarily going to be that way. Right? we got... And you know what? I think in the last world war, North America was probably spared a lot by God because of the level of Christianity that was here at that time. And you know, that's, that's watered down, that's depleted. People have gone away from God. We're allowing homosexuality in our countries. Godlessness. There's so many atheists. There's so many other false religions in, in these countries. And not just that, the Christians are backslidden. They're not living for God. They're, they're ashamed of the words of the Bible. You think God's going to spare us this next time? By us, I mean our countries? I don't think so. Now, us as Christians, He's not going to allow a hair of your head to perish unless, unless He allows it to. But I just want to drive it home that we should not be happy about war. I don't care if it's Muslims. I don't care if it, who it is that's dying. The only time I'm going to be happy if somebody dies is if they're an enemy of God. If they, they're a son of Belial, they're, they're a sodomite or a false prophet or something that is a hater of God, they're a reprobate. That's only somebody that's tampered with the Bible, right? That's when I'm going to be happy. Somebody that deserves death like that. But not if, even if they're not innocent people, right? Well, they're, they're in a war and they're fighting each other. They both want to kill each other. I'm still not happy that's happening. That's a wicked attitude. Anyway, getting back to Babylon. For she saith in her heart, I said a queen, and I am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. Famine. She shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her, when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great, great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. And that's why I think it's the United States, because all these people that are selling stuff is like, they're sad because this country is destroyed, because nobody's going to buy their stuff anymore. And, and if you want to know how much stuff comes to the United States that, and Canada, just look, go look at these shipping ports and these big cargo ships filled with containers of stuff that comes here every day into North America. We're buying a lot of stuff, okay? There's probably not a family here that hasn't bought something off of eBay from China or somewhere, right? Or AliExpress or something like that. 
It's not an advertisement for any, either of those. But it happens, right? We buy stuff from overseas. And I think that's why the, the U.S. is uh, end times Babylon. And no, they're not going to be able to say, I'm, uh, I said, a queen and now I'm no widow and shall see no sorrow. No, I believe God will spare his people. And some people he'll allow, some he will allow to die. But uh, not a hair of your head is going to perish without him saying so. So what about the, the Bible talking about war, right? The, the verses in the Bible, right? The ones that almost seem to speak positively about us being ready for war and doing war. Like Exodus 15, verse 3 and 4, it says, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Okay, yeah, he is a man of war. He can rain down fire and brimstone on people. But you know, in this context, Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drawn in the Red Sea. You know what? The children of Israel didn't have to fight in that one. They went through on dry ground, and then God closed in the waters. That's how he fought the war. He killed, God killed the people, not, not actual humans killed the people. What about Psalm 18, verse 34? He teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand holdeth, holdeth me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. See, God teaches our hands to war. But like I said, there's a time to war. There's no nothing wrong with learning how to defend yourself. Shooting a gun, hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, operating a fighter jet, for, for instance. But um, he teaches your hands to war, but safety is still of the Lord, though. right? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll fight if somebody comes and attacks us. Right? If some hoodlums come attack my house, yeah, I'm going to kill them till they're dead. That's, I mean, that's as far as you can kill them. After that, you're not killing them anymore. But, I, I mean, I don't want to kill anybody. But if somebody comes and attacks my family, I will. Right? And that's the attitude we should have with our country. If somebody attacks us, we'll fight back. But let's not get involved with other people's strife. Let's not be happy about things like that. Let's not be people that sharpen our tongues like adders and are just ready for war. That's wicked. In uh, Psalm 144, he says something similar. Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Yeah, he, that's good if he teaches you that. I think every man should have some um, method of protecting your family. But notice what the next verse says, though. My goodness and my fortress, my high tower, and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Right? He, he teaches us to war, and we get our horse ready for war, but safety is still of the Lord. We trust in him. I don't trust in my ability to shoot down bad guys. No. I don't, I don't trust in, you know, the... Canada's ability to defend us against bad nations, I trust in the Lord. <laughs> I mean, that would be foolish of me to trust Canada, and, and no slight on the soldiers. I think they're, they're probably one of the best trained in, in the world, from what I've heard. It's not their fault that the, mil, you know, the, the politicians aren't giving them the tools, right? But I still don't, even if they had, if we were armed like the U.S., let's say they didn't cancel the Avro Arrow and we were the world superpower, right? Because, I mean, the, we all know the Avro Arrow was better than the Blackbird even back then, right? Any of us that have done any research into it. And you can see how the new fighter jets copy the, the, you know, the Delta Wing and stuff like that from the Avro Arrow. Um, but I'm glad we're not like that. But even if we had an army or a military like that, I still wouldn't trust in that, though. It'd be tempting, though, to trust in your own strength if you're strong and you know, know, uh, you know jujitsu and karate and kung fu and a couple other Chinese words, right? You'd be tempted to trust in your own strength. And, and people do, right? If they're, they're walk around like this, right? And, um, and they know some stuff, right? There's some bad dude. They, they trust in their, their own strength sometimes, right? And, and, and the U.S. as a country, they are that bad dude, right? But as Christians, we should not trust in our military. We, I mean, look at who's holding, you know, who's holding the, gets to carry the football in the United States? A guy that doesn't even know how to walk off of stage. 
He doesn't know, you know, what his next line is, right? Uh, some kids get get killed, and he's coming on, uh, not to say, oh, I'm sorry for the victims. He's like licking an ice cream cone and jo making jokes, right? <laughs> As an American, I would not have any faith in a, that kind of a leader protecting us. You could have the best, you know, weapons in the world, but if you don't have a good decision maker, you're, you're, you're hooped. And even if there was some mean dude there as a president, I still wouldn't put my faith in the military. I would trust the Lord. And that's, you know, David is saying, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. But then he goes on that he's his goodness, his fortress, his high tower, his deliverer, his shield. He, and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. It's like, and David was a warrior. I mean, he killed Goliath with one stone out of his sling. He, he fought with a bear and a lion. He was a warrior. But he's still trusting in the Lord. In Psalm 18, uh, verse 29, 30, For by thee I've run through a troop. And by my God have I leaped over a wall. But then he, he puts the next verse again. He talks about trusting in God. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all that trust in him. You can run through an army and not get hurt. You can jump over a wall. But still he's saying, I trust in God because God is a buckler. But buckler is a shield. He's a shield, right? And that, that's what God said to Abraham. Fear not. I'm, uh, he said, and this is paraphrasing, I'm your, your, uh, your shield your shield and your exceeding great reward, right? So he was in protection and your blessing. Now, I don't think we should be pacifists, that if somebody attacks us, that we shouldn't fight at all. I, I don't think we should, we should protect our family, we, can, we should protect ourselves. Not if somebody just shames you or, or slaps you on the face, you should turn the other cheek. You know, in Luke 22, um, verse 36, it says, Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise a script. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Jesus is saying, If you don't have a sword, sell one of your clothes and buy one. If it was today, he might be saying, Sell one of your, your jackets and, and go buy a gun. Right? He, he might say that. But he still doesn't want you to trust in that gun or that sword. He wants him, Jesus wants us to trust in him. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is the Lord. And you know what? In Proverbs 8, 36, and we'll talk about this in the afternoon, but it says, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. And you know, there's people that love death. The industrial military complex loves death, and they love it because of all the money. Right? And that's why when they're sending weapons to a certain country, and then they're sending it to the enemies of that country, they, they don't try to make one country get too much because they want the war to keep going. Right? So they can keep selling stuff. Because if they sell enough to one country to just wipe out the other country, well, then it's going to be over too quick, right? And you're not going to be able to sell enough ammunition and missiles and whatever, RPGs, mortars, you name it. The Bible says in the New Testament, 1 John 3, 14, 15, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. You should not hate your brother. And the Bible is saying, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. What about if you hate other people enough for you want them to die, and they're not the enemies of God, they're just either your enemies or the enemies of your nation. The Bible says you're a murderer if you hate your brother. And I don't think God thinks favorably about you wanting all Muslims to die. I want them to get saved. Now, very few do, sadly. Jesus says, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And you know what? He wants us to have an attitude where we can take some, take some stuff before we're, we're going to fight back. Now, if somebody has bad intent, go ahead, blow their brains out. Okay? I don't think the Bible would speak bad about you, God wouldn't be angry at you if you go kill somebody because you're trying to kill your wife or your kids or you. But if you're out spoiling for a fight, right? It's like I've seen memes where the man and the wife are in bed and then the woman's like, 
I think I heard something. The guy's just got a big smile on his face, and then on the wall are all these guns. It's like, <laughs> I get to use it, right? We shouldn't be like that, right? I would hate to use it. I would, I would, I wouldn't hesitate, but I still don't want to, right? The Bible says in Luke 6, verse 36, Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. We shouldn't be people that are just love bloodshed. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs 24, 17, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. You know, he could change his mind about punishing your enemies. And as Christians, we should remember that we don't war after the flesh. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 and 4, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, the pulling down of strongholds. And, you know, I don't say all this because I want you to be scared about Iran and, and Israel. You know what? Ever since I've been a kid, there's always been conflict in the Middle East, right? Maybe not at the same time as, you, you know, Ukraine and Russia are fighting. But there's always been conflict, always on the brink of war, right? And it almost seems like this is scheduled. Oh, it, uh, Iran's going to attack in 48 hours. And then all of a sudden they, they backed it off. Well, I guess they need more time. Uh it's imminent. It's going to be soon, right? And then eventually they did throw some stuff at them, right? And you know what? We shouldn't trust what we hear in the media. We hear once, I, you know, I started reading a book, and I want to finish it, about World War II. It's interesting. They kept us Canadians in the dark for the first few days. They did not tell us the complete picture. And if it was an actual all-out war, I don't think they'd give us the picture. Yeah, there's some people that are blowing the trumpet. It's the start of World War III. That's to some extent is clickbait for YouTube, right? So that they'll get more views, more ad revenue. But we shouldn't be scared. The Bible says, "No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper." And you know those promises that that the Jew worshippers say, you know, but that God will bless them uh, that that bless you and will curse them that curse you. That applies to us, not to those Jesus rejecting. Uh, people over in the Middle East. That applies to us. So God will bless those that bless the Christians. God will curse them that curse the Christians. Okay. And you know what? I, I th the, the, what started this idea of doing this sermon, besides hearing about this war, is I thought of then of uh, what Jesus said, and he, it is in uh, at least two places in the Bible. In Matthew 24, 6, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. But then he goes on to say all these things that will happen. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. That's just the start of it, right? And then, then he goes on how how we could be delivered, and all these different things. Uh, not in this one, but the, in, in the other account of this, he says, not a hair of your head will perish. But I want to look at verse 12. It says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because all these sins abound, people's love gets cold. And they don't love the Lord. You know what? And if anybody hears this on the internet, I know none of you are like this, or I'm pretty sure... That we're not like, yeah, those Jews should kill all, all the Muslims. Just wipe them out, nuke them, whatever. Right? Turn into a parking lot. That's wicked. But you know what? They should read Jeremiah 21. And Jer Jeremiah tells uh, some people a message to Zedekiah. Remember, these are so the so-called chosen people. The ones that the people in a lot of Baptist churches would say are the chosen people of God. Then said Jeremiah unto them, Thus shall he say to Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, wherewith you fight against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans, which besiege you without the walls, and I will assemble them into the midst of the city. And I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand, with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. And I'll smite the inhabitants of the city, both man and beast, they shall die of a great pestilence. That's how much you should pray for Israel right now. God himself, at this time, when, when 
Judah was cursed, God said, I'm going to fight against you myself. I'm going to turn your weapons back. And they're not going to help you anything. If God has this kind of angry attitude towards God for uh, hating people of Judah at that time, do you think he wants us to bless them now? No, he doesn't. Wrath could be upon us for helping them. And we shouldn't delight in war at all. And not it's not an exception. Oh, it's because it's Israel's fighting against Muslims? No, there's no exception like that. I'm just going to end with Psalm 120, verse uh, 5 to 7. Woe is me that I sojourn in Mesech, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him, with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. We shouldn't delight in war. We should be for peace. The Bible says that we should live peaceably as much as po possible with all men. So you maybe think the machines of war are cool, and that's fine. Just don't think that killing people is cool. That it's fun or good what's happening. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for your word. And help us be peace-loving people. Help us to love you. And help us not support those that hate you, God. And help us not pray for them that reject your son and, and the, the, your enemies. Yes, we should pray for those that aren't saved, but uh, not pray for those that, that are, are uh, reprobate, God. Please help us. Help us have good attitudes. Help us love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.